I want to thank you all for coming today. I'm so glad you could be here with me for my final presentation in the math department, which is entitled, Why Does California Have 53 Representatives? A Look at the History of Apportionment in the United States. And there have been lots of questions to me why I chose California. I chose California because it has the highest number of representatives. That's the only connection to California. For months, we have heard about the Democratic nomination and delegates. How many delegates are up for grabs? How many delegates to win? This process will repeat itself come November when we elect the next president of the United States. And Anderson Cooper and Wolf Blitzer will stand on CNN and tell us about the states where you can get the most electoral votes. California, Texas, New York, and Florida. Well, how did those states get so many votes in the first place? It all is determined by their number of representatives in Congress. And their number of representatives in the House of Representatives is directly correlated with apportionment. So what's apportionment? Apportionment is the act of apportioning. So what's apportioning? <laughs> to apportion is to divide and share out according to a plan, to make a proportionate division or distribution. And the key is the fact that each group is entitled to a different proportion of the whole. And that is based on a certain measure. In the House of Representatives, that measure is population. So why should we care? We should care because of the power of each state. Each state has a certain power to pass bills that affect all of us, whether we like it or we agree with it or not. It is also important that no state or faction has all the decision-making power. In the history of the United States, there have been certain factions that have always been at war, whether it's the large states versus the small states, the north versus the south, or rural versus industrial. As mentioned earlier, it is also important in the selection of our presidents. In the election of 1824, 1876, 1888, and 2000, the winning candidate of the popular vote lost in the Electoral College, thus making it important to have a good apportionment. So what's the apportionment problem? In the Constitution, it states that representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers. And that's in Article 1, Section 2. Section 2 goes on to say that the number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative. So the basic problem is seemingly easy enough. You have at least one representative for each state, and you can't have more than one representative for each 30,000 people. But those pesky fractions, they get in the way all the time. In the Constitution, we can also gleam other guidelines, including the fact that proportionality is the ideal division scheme. The basis of por por proportionality should be the population of each state. Apportionment should be recalculated regularly, and in the case of the House of Representatives, it's every 10 years. And also, the lower and upper limits found in the Constitution can override a pure apportionment. Also, the historical founders of apportionment felt that each apportionment should guarantee quota. The exact quota of a state is its population divided by the total U.S. population. It, each state should have no more than their upper quota, which is the smallest integer greater than their exact quota, and no less than their lower quota, which is the largest integer less than their exact quota. As mentioned earlier, the problem really comes in in the fractions. It is impossible to have a fraction of a representative, thus making a true apportionment unachievable. Inevitably, some states will be overrepresented while others are underrepresented. The other line that causes problems is according to their respective numbers. What measure determines that number? The other thing to consider is the fact that the House size was not fixed until 1940. At the end of each apportionment, the House of Representatives had to decide their House size, and that also led to problems with apportionment. I will now go over the two main historical methods. In my paper, I go over all the methods, including proposed ones that were never actually used, but we're just going to scale it down a little. The first Congress actually wanted to just drop the fractions. They used the smallest ratio of 30,000 and then came up with the house size by summing the integers. The Senate, however, disagreed with this, and congressional deadlock ensued, something we're all familiar with, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, this method was never used for apportionment, and Al Treasurer, Secretary of the Treasurer Alexander Hamilton proposed the next method. He said that you should divide the U.S. population by a term determined ratio, and then get the house size from that. Then divide each state by that ratio, and give to each of them their lower quota. 
you're obviously going to end up with a couple extra seats because the total is less than each individual one. So he said to assign the extra seats, give them to each largest fraction until all the seats were assigned. George Washington actually vetoed this bill because a common divisor was not used for each state. This could lead to fixing of apportionments in the future and an unequal representation. Actually, um, eventually, this method was used, a variation of it, in the apportionments of 1880 and 1890. So next came Secretary of State Je Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson said to determine the ratio first and then the house size. You would give each state their lower quota and then sum the integers. If it's a fixed house size, you'd have to adjust the ratio so that the integers sum to the correct house size. This method was used in the apportionments from 1790 to 1830. But eventually it was discovered that this method favors the larger states since the portion of the whole dropped in the fraction is less for larger states than smaller states. All of these historical methods met quota, which was, as mentioned earlier, one of the common sense things that the founders thought was important. But in moving on forward, they discovered the Alabama paradox. The Alabama paradox occurs when as house size increases, a state actually loses seats. Doesn't make sense, right? Well, it's actually allowed in some methods. So the modern methods were designed to avoid the Alabama paradox. But in doing that, they all violate quota and cannot guarantee it. It was proven, though, that some methods will stay closer to quota than others. I would now like to demonstrate the two modern methods using my illustrative problem that I used throughout my paper, which had to do with the Drake Student Senate. The Drake Student Senate currently has 22 senators around the table. There are 10 senators at large, 6 academic senators, 3 organizational senators, and 3 diversity interest senators. My question was, what would the Drake Student Senate look like if it was apportioned by academic college? These are the enrollment numbers for Drake as of fall 2007. Only for undergraduates, as I felt, felt that undergraduates would be most likely to run for Senate and most affected by Senate's decisions. Also, this only includes everyone's first major. As we know, there are a lot of dual degrees and double majors, but we only use the first major listed in Blueview. So this is, may not be a true apportionment, but it should give us an idea. The exact quota was found by taking the enrollment of each college, divided by the total enrollment, and then multiplying by the house size, which in this case is 22. The Webster method was developed by Daniel Webster. He felt the process should be more mathematically based. And according to the Constitution, it said that apportionment should result from a common divisor. So Webster chose a ratio, divided each state population by that ratio, and then just applied basic rounding techniques to get to an integer. He summed the integers, and that was the house size. The ratio can be adjusted to sum to a desired house size. For the Drake Student Senate problem, the quotient was 170. And as you can see, none of the states are violated by quota. Michael L. Belinsky and H. Peyton Young actually proved that the Webster method was the only method that stayed nearest to the exact quota. In fact, for the apportionments from 1790 to, from 1790 to 1970, Webster never violated quota. It was used in the apportionment of 1840, and then a variation, uh, it was used in 1880 and 1890 with the variation of the Hamilton method, but the house size was chosen so that the two methods matched. And when it came to the apportionment of 1900, Webster and Hamilton could no longer be reconciled to match, as Hamilton actually gave Maine three or four states, depending on the house size, so they just abandoned it completely. In 1920, however, things changed again. This is where Edward V. Huntington, professor of mechanics and mathematics at Harvard, began his work on apportionment in 1921. Huntington felt an apportionment should be stable, meaning that no inequality computed by a chosen measure can be reduced by the transfer of one seat to another state. He also felt that each method should be mo house monotone, meaning it does not allow the Alabama paradox. He developed various tests of inequality that measured the difference between two states. And what he discovered was that each method was either unstable or yielded one of five methods. 